Welcome back to part two. I'm Dr. Carl Goldkamp, and we're gonna continue exactly where we left off. Here's a study that I want to introduce you to. Um, this is a study that is the most accessed, most requested study in 2017. So much so that this person got a prize for writing this paper. This was written by Dr. Artemis Sinopoulos, who I just happened to get off the phone today with about 45 minute conversation. Total joy to talk to her. She's now 86 and at the top of her field. Absolutely. She's requested, uh, her papers are requested by the World Health Organization, UNESCO, um, and it goes on from there. And they're starting a project in uh, Minnesota and um, on from there. But in this particular study, they want to focus on it's an increase in the omega 6 3 fatty acid ratio increases the risk for obesity. This came out in 2016, became very popular in 2017. Let me get to the core of what this is instead of reading it to you line by line. So, prospective studies clearly show an increase in the risk of obesity as the levels of omega 6 fatty acids increase, and the omega 6 3 ratio increases in the red blood cell. And this is where you get your uh, omega panel, by the way. It's the measuring of the fat in the red blood cell. And we'll see that in a second. Uh, membrane phospholipids. Whereas the high omega-3 red blood cell membrane phospholipid decreases the risk of obesity. Seesaw. We've talked about this. Recent studies in humans have shown that the addition of absolute amount of omega-6 and omega-3 fatty acid intake the omega-6-3 ratio plays an important role in increasing the development of obesity via arachidonic acid, and we'll skip that rather part, uh, which can be reversed, which can be reversed, which can be reversed with the intake of omega-3, EPA, DHA. So balance is what you're looking for. So what I want to say is, this is true, and uh, Artemis, now first name basis, right? Artemis would be the first to say that. At the same time, you have to identify what is your source of omega-6 and reduce that. So if you're eating crap food and that's your source, and I'm hoping it's not, it's something like you're eating too much, you know, grocery store chicken, or I have to, I have to give you a little tidbit here. Did you know that the average grocery store chicken, egg, egg, chicken, egg, has about a 20 to 1 ratio of omega-6 to 3, 20 to 1. And um, she had done a lot of work in Crete, and she's Greek. If you ever talk to her, you know she's Greek, and she's a reader of Aristotle, but I digress, that she studied a lot about the diets in Crete, and you know why is it that they have a, they have a 1 to 1 ratio of 6 to 3? How can they have a 1 to 1 ratio of 6 to 3? They don't have it in Europe, in Spain, um, or Italy, as much as they'd like to claim they do. They don't, but it's in Crete, they have a one-to-one. -one. And the chicken eggs in Crete have a one-to-one -one ratio of six to three in the egg yolk of the egg. That's phenomenal. So what that shows is, and yeah, it's what they, what they eat and how they're reared and so on and so forth, is that A, it's possible, right? So you can directly affect the health of the rest of the country by changing the omega-6 to 3 ratio of eggs. So if you rear, if you have, if you're lucky enough to have your own chickens, now you know, do not feed them grains, which is probably what you knew, but just let them go out and get bugs. In fact, eat grass and so on and so forth. They do eat plants. And in that, they will change that ratio. Okay, digress a little bit, but it's a big deal and it has to do with obesity and you knew that. Well, here we go again. So I want to just throw this in from a past uh, video saying two studies. Here's what the studies were shown, um, both in the United States and Australia. We've talked about before. And this is the arcing up of obesity because the two studies were showing, they had their conclusions before they started doing the studies. That's how they do it in the pharmaceutical industry, right? <laughs> this is a conclusion and work backwards. Um, is that, you know, increase your polyunsaturated omega-6 oils, drop your saturated fats, and you'll increase, uh, and you'll decrease your cholesterol. All that is absolutely true, but you won't decrease heart disease. In fact, you'll increase heart disease, and you'll increase cancer rates. Oops. 
Okay, comparing these side by sides, obesity since 1977, chronic disease since 1935, kind of look the same. I know it's not the same time slide, uh, but you can't argue with the incline is dramatically similar. Do we have a match? U.S. consumption of vegetable oil versus diabetes prevalence in the U.S. So this is from 1960s. Here we go from 1960s, that point there. They're going up. Amazing. So that's about 1,000 to 15,000. And this is, oh, I don't know what the units are. It's thousands of metric tons of consumption of these particular oils, specifically of all these oils. And this is the diabetes prevalence in the United States. There you go. So not only obesity, but diabetes is correlated with omega-6. One of the modern ills of post-World War II Western diets is outrageously the out-of-balance omega-6-3 fatty acid ratio, 20 to 1 in the U.S., 15 to 18 to 1 in the U.K., all due to the seed oils, a.k.a. cheap industrial oils, added to our food today, omega-6, linolenic acid, Certainly wasn't there 150 years ago. So 150 years ago is 1880s, not that long ago. Here's from another site, statistics, consumption of edible oils in the United States 2020 by type. There's soybean and basically nothing after soybean. Soybean and canola oil. Then palm oil, which is a saturated fat. Canola, uh, coconut oil, saturated. Olive oil. A monosaturated oleic oil, primarily. There you go. Okay, here we go. These are, that red line is soy, soybean oil. This is the 50s of the Eisenhower administration and the heart attacks, which provoked the whole research. Here's where the two studies are done. So at the time of the two studies, this is where the inflection occurred for having more approved, right? Government approved. And here's the canola. So the two things from 2020 clearly started in the 60s. And here's where the studies were done. Trends in the estimated per capita consumption of seed oils, 1909 to 1999, and it's rocketing out with canola oil. All right, time to remove all doubt. Here's the omega-6, there's the omega-3. So what, would, what they did here, it's heart attack rates, coronary heart disease death by country. So what they have is percent of omega-6 high un unsaturated fatty acid is what that means. It says primary prevention happens here, meaning keeping down omega-6. Heart attacks is here. So the higher heart attacks are over here. And so what we have is USA quartiles, not even just a country, quartiles. Here's the lowest quartiles are still very high. The next quartile, the next quartile, and the next quartile. So it's, it's zoomingly high in the United States. Lower in Quebec, there's the, and Quebec is the Native American, uh, Quebec, Quebec Cree, Quebec Inuits, Japan, and uh, Greenland. And so that was for measuring blood fatty acids, and that was 2009. So it's not that long ago. So now we have omega-3, and this is also from 2017, more recent, saying basically increasing rates of omega-3 levels severely reduced the risk, actually not even the risk, the outcome of, this is post-mortem. This is the New England Journal of Medicine, 2002, measuring, this is a study going back, reviewing that, um, dramatic. So increasing omega-3s decreases your heart attack risk. Increasing your omega-6 gives you a heart attack. Any questions? This is your heart on omega-6. Doesn't look good. Okay, so basically omega-3 fatty acids, modern diet, natural diet, considerably different. So people who have an omega-6-3 ratio of less than two tended to eat less overall. That's the other aspect. When you get the ratio back in line, like it should have been, your appetite adjusts. You're no longer hungry all the time. So I, there's a really interesting, whole nother level of this conversation that goes to elevated 6-3 drives a whole cannabinoid um, system that makes you want to go eat more and more and more. It's not TH6, by the way. It's endogenous cannabinoid, cannabinoid system. Okay, here's another way of looking at that. And this came out in 2012. And this is by country and saturated fats. The countries that ate more saturated, total energy from saturated fats. Down here, France. Uh, we got Finland. Surprise UK is over there. Finland. 
I think that's uh, oh Poland, Iceland, Finland. Over here, up there are Moldavia, Georgia. The United States should be up there someplace. Um, but anyways, you get the saturated fats. They're all an another part of that. Okay, adding a layer of insight here. Okay, micronutrients. Well, now we really opened up the can, haven't we? So this is 2020. Micronutrients for the treatment of psychiatric symptoms in clinical samples of systematic review. So this is really interesting. This came from the United States. It happens to be a naturopathic school in Portland. We used to call it uh, national. I went to Bastyr in Seattle. There are our rivals. Didn't have football teams or any of that. It's med schools. Um, Portland, Portland, Australia, Sydney, UK, Swansea University, and New, uh, and, and New Zealand. New Zealand, Australia, England, and naturopathic schools um, in the United States. And actually Oregon uh, University, not just naturopathic. Pretty interesting. So what they find? So from the abstract, they reviewed all the all the study, all the studies that were actually done, and they found with uh, micronutrients consisting of at least four vitamins and or minerals as interventions for participants in psychiatric um, symptoms. Blah blah blah. Uh, so in ADHD, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder population, statistically and clinically significant improvements were found in global functioning. That's an interesting thing. When you improve this ratio, you get global restoration to functioning, and unless there was physical damage already done. So thinking clearly, behavioral, emotional, intellectual. Okay, benefit for global measures of improvement in autism and in participants with behavioral deficits and dementia and in post-natural disaster anxiety, and the number of violent incidents in prison populations also improved. Broad-spectrum formulas, vitamins, and minerals demonstrated more robust effect than formulas with fewer ingredients. Amazing, don't you think? Amazing, don't you think? Okay, truism of healing. When things improve, heal, they improve in all aspects. So take the age-related macular degeneration. Take the Parkinson's group that I introduced you to. When you start improving their movement, it's going to be their thinking, it's going to be their mood, it's going to be their, their sleep at night. And then there's this study with fish oil, aka omega-3. Fish oil contain high levels of omega-3, you knew that, which have been shown to help our physical well-being, but can they also assist in mental health? Okay then, let me elaborate. It's not only the truth of what will happen, but there's a breakout studies on this exact issue, meaning there's, there, there's a number of studies now pounding the concrete saying this is important. Now, if you give omega-3 to this set of different populations, here we have fish oil helped stave off psychosis in study patients 2021, a long chain fatty acid, omega-3 fatty acids for, indicated for the prevention of psychotic disorders. Conclusion, long-chain fatty omega-3s reduce the risk of progression to psychotic, psychotic disorder and may offer a safe and effectious, um, efficacious strategy for the indicated prevention in young people with subthreshold psychotic states. That's amazing. Can fish oil prevent schizophrenia and other psychotic disorders? 2015. So let me ask you, if omega-3 fatty acids, fish oil, has a profound positive effect. Don't you think it is because of the incredibly unprecedented increase in omega-6 oils in our processed foods? I also want to say that all these, all these studies are not looking at omega-6. These studies are just giving omega-3. They're, they're taking this risk of giving them a natural substance. I know it sounds I'm being a little bit sarcastic and perhaps condescending and, and insulting and sorry. Um, but what they're really addressing is the omega-6 issue. That's brilliant. 2021, this is happening now. The fish oil study that is changing the world, but really didn't mean to. Seriously, this is funny. This is really funny. 2010, fish oil may reduce the risk of psychotic disorders in high-risk individuals, February 2nd, 2010. And guess where it was reported? It was reported in JAMA, Journal of American Medical Association. In JAMA. Oops. JAMA let that one out? Okay. 
uh, individuals at extremely high risk of developing psychosis appear less likely to develop psychotic disorders following a 12 week, three months, four months. Um, yeah, four months, of course, of fish oil capsules containing omega 3s. Wait, the American Journal of, Medi uh, of American Medical Associates said this? Actual study came out in 2009. Wow, long chain omega 3 fatty acids. Indicated prevention of psychotic disorders. That's a pretty potential. And here's what happened. Um, context. The use of antipsychotic medication for prevention of psychotic disorders is really controversial. It's giving the medicine before, hey, we think these kids, given the context of their, you know, are going to get psychotic. How they define that, I don't know. I didn't read that part. But you give them omega-3s saying, hey, it may be beneficial because uh, in a range of psychiatric conditions, including schizophrenia. Given that, omega-3s are generally beneficial to health without clinically relevant adverse effects. So it's all positive, no negative. Conclusion, omega-3 reduced the risk of progression to psychotic disorders. And that's pretty much the end of it. How is this relevant? Given what we know now, and what is the conclusion of all this? What we need to do is both support glutathione and get our omega-6 ratio down to 2-1 to 1-1. One, one. It can be done. It can be done. Okay. When you're underproducing glutathione, there's only two reasons. Your diet is either inadequate and, and you have a reduced ability to produce it genetically or you are over consuming it, meaning you are stressed environmentally and one of those stressors, one of those stressors and one of those environmental toxins is omega-6. So if there is a lot of omega-6 in your diet, in your red blood cells, to be very specific, it is sucking out, it is consuming, it is using the, uh, the glutathione because it is causing the inflammation. So dietary glutathione is poorly absorbed. So it's not just take glutathione, there's special forms, we'll get into it in a second. The general recommendation is to have sulfur containing veggies. People have asked, can you do this naturally? I don't know. You know, I was more or less 20 years of all about veggies. And either it was the unwillingness of people to do this or any clear. But anyway, those veggies would be onion, garlic, spinach, avocados, asparagus, cruciferous, the Brussels sprouts primarily, and broccoli, okra, richest dietary sources of sulfur containing. So what is sulfur containing? It's cysteine. Remember, that was the rate limiting step in making glutathione with cysteine. This is what you're getting. You're getting the precursors to make cysteine, and some of these you're getting cysteine as well. So cooking and storage conditions can decrease the amount of glutathione found in food. In reality, these are necessary, but certainly no guarantee. So would I go to the Parkinson's group and say, this is what you're going to do? I would... I would get a, a di I would get a, uh, a dietitian. Somebody who's going to teach them how to do this because that's necessary. This alone won't make a dramatic change. Would I go to Pope John Paul if he was still alive? I'd say let's get in with the big guns first, and we then coach his cooks who are cooking for him and teach them what to do. So animal sources are actually really the best for cysteine, which is a rate limiting step. Okay. So that's the past. What do you need? What do you need to know now? Two tests you need to do for yourself: omega six three panel. So it's called the omega panel, by the way. Then I'll show you that glutathione test. I'll show you can that. That's not as easy to do, but I'll show you, and it will be easy to do in the next six months. And in lieu of glutathione, what you could get is your inflammatory marker. So get your CRP. It's not a direct correlation, but it's saying systemically how much inflammation you have. It's not going to say well, you're pre-Parkinson's and you have a deprived portion of your brain, the substantia nigra of glutathione. Now, it's not going to give you that, but it's going to give you kind of a blanket statement. You're, you're, you're not really inflamed here. Um, but that would be what you would do in the meantime. But I've talked with LabCorp, which I like their panel, and uh, in six months they'll be offering, and we'll get into that, okay? Okay, so how to test for glutathione. Companies that do this, Doctors Data, LabCorp, Genova. I'm just going to show you Doctors Data to keep this story simple. This is what it looks like. It costs about $85 um, plus $15 of handling if you put it through your doc. So your doc has to order this for you. All right, but here's what I want to read to you. Uh, low levels of glutathione have been associated with cardiovascular disease, cancer, AIDS, autism, alcoholism, debilitating 
neurodegenerative diseases such as Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, chronic retention of potential toxic chemicals like mercury, lead, arsenic, I didn't even get into that part. I mentioned it before. It actually does chelate heavy metals and takes them out little by little by little. So you need to have this. And if you think you're not exposed to heavy metals, you're dreaming. Chemicals and other some drugs, intracellular glutathione, biosynthesis, and we'll leave it there. So moderate alcohol consumption, smoking. Oh, I don't want to say high normal uh, glutathione demands include moderate alcohol consumption, smoking, regular physical exercise. So you're stimulating your body to either you're introducing a toxin like smoking and perhaps you can argue alcohol goes to the liver. And so it has to upregulate temporarily. When you're exercising, whether it's high intensity training or cardio, whatever the thing is you do, you've induced an upregulation because you're now stimulating, you're, you're, you're oxidizing a lot of things. Okay, magnesium and potassium are required for both energy-dependent enzymes, steps in glutathione uh, production. Cysteine is the rate-limiting amino acid. Nutritional products have been documented to increase red blood cell glutathione biosynthesis, include whey, high-quality whey protein, alpha-lipoic acid, curcumin, oral liposomal glutathione, nebulized glutathione, and to a lesser extent, N-acetyl-L-cysteine, which is NAC, and what hey, this was a little bit too dated when they got this. That's also acetyl, um, S acetyl glutathione. It's just neat, these things are available. Okay, these are doctored ordered tests, unfortunately, right now, right here. I just give you an example. Pretty cheap though. Uh, if your doctor ordered this test from Boston Heart Diagnosis, they would send you a kit. You'd have to figure out where to get that. He'd probably help you to go, go to your doctor, your do and, but it's pretty cheap. If they give you a kit, you get the blood draw, you put it in the kit, you put it back in the mail and then you send it back to Boston Heart Diagnostics. LabCorp is like Quest. They have, there's probably five LabCorp phlebotomy centers around where you live. Um, get your doctor or this 45 bucks plus is 15. Anyway, the price is probably very, I call it 50 bucks. And there's red blood cell uh, analysis, uh, glutathione analysis, doctor's data is more expensive. They're all pretty good quality. Doctor's data has never been anything less than really perfect. Uh, LabCorp, I'm getting to know more since I'm kind of doing more with LabCorp than Quest. Um, they have a great panel. Okay then, here was a panel, speaking of LabCorp, Judy and I just got our panels done. This is the Omega panel, so they call it Omega Check. It's actually out of Cleveland um, Hospital. So here we go. We're pretty much do the same thing, right? Here's the difference. I take intermittent, up until now, I would take maybe once or twice a week some fish oil. She would not. She doesn't like to take supplements. She would eat for lunch uh, mackerel or sardines. I would every so often, but probably not. And um, that's the primary difference. So what differences do we see? We are pretty much the same in terms of omega-3. So this stands for, omega-3 total, stands for your percent of omega-3 as a percentage of fat in your red blood cell. You like to be over eight, by the way. They don't show you that here because the average for the United States is so low. You know, they go, well, but anyways, you, there is documentation under 8%, you are still prone to heart disease of various types. So we still got some work to do. Our ratio from, where'd that go? Ratio of omega-6 to 3 is 5.7. I'm a little better because I'm taking my fish oil, but the only, there are no processed foods in our life. So the only source of omega-6 in this situation is from chicken meat, meat, egg yolks, and pork. So will we be changing any of that? <sighs> Probably not. Um, I would like to find a better source for all of those. Hey, I would like to find the, the pig farm that's gonna give me slaughtered, great, and you know, I'll get a freezer for it, but I haven't found that. Same with the chickens, same with the chicken eggs. So those are things to work on. But in the meantime, guess what? I will be more, I will be daily, and so will Judy be daily with her omega-6. And so this is just part of our labs. I thought you'd appreciate it. When you come down here to lanoleic acid, which is what we're talking about, that's the omega-6, who has more? She has more. So the only difference is the omega-3. So the idea that omega-3 can pull that ratio back to your benefit is a big, big deal. So if I were worried about obesity, if I was worried about diabetes, I was worried about any of the things I've covered tonight, I would be thinking about omega-6 and omega-3, and I'd be taking fish oils, EPA, DHA. 
And arachidonic acid is the inflammatory one. So she's more inflammatory. And she was. She had a CRP. It was pretty significant. I had mine. was nothing at all. And so that is all. The only difference is really about me taking oral uh, a fish oil, and she was actually eating sardines, and she was doing the hard work. I was doing the easy work, and I had better outcomes. So you got to do it. It is something we got to do here. I'm just saying the two things. What are the two things? Glutathione and omega-3. You got to do these. I hope you go to sleep thinking about this. I hope you wake up willing to do something about it. Okay, what supplements are effective for increasing glutathione? We'll go quickly. A few big names are general, CoQ10, selenium, Vitamin C and E, they're general antioxidants. B6 and B12, remember we talked about the glutathione machine? B6 and B12, uh, for those, MTHFR were a big deal. So it's, it's what this is pointing to is your glutathione machine. They're trying to goose, lubricate your glutathione machine, have it work better. So extra methyl donors could help those with MTHFR. Remember the Parkinson story? Okay, supplements that support glutathione to be regenerated. ALA, alpha lipoic acid, good product of whey. Whey is the waste product from cheese from manufacturing. So it is dairy. So if people have an issue with dairy, and I've done this for a little while as an experiment, and I did get congested. Would I not do it ever? I don't know, but I'm not going to do it for a while because I didn't like being so congested. Milk thistle, that was famous for the last 30 years. Curcumin, equally famous. Here's what I did is a scale of effectiveness for increasing glutathione. I would start um, down here with milk, thistle, and whey. They're good things to do on a regular basis. Anything you do on a regular basis will benefit you, period. Curcumin, CoQ10, ALA, N-acetylcysteine. Now we're getting much more specific, right? We're getting right down to next to glutathione production. A liposomal glutathione, acetyl glutathione, and a general support of vitamin A and C. Now I did scale of cost, pretty much the same thing. The most effective ones are the most expensive. The least effective, but effective to an extent, are cheaper. Okay, I just simply put out, you could look at these in Wellovate, by the way. I just said they're supplements. These are supplements we're now talking about. Here's acetyl, um, acetyl glutathione quickly absorbed. That's why it's become expensive and that's why it's available. A number of companies have this now. Liposomal glutathione. If you have any questions, you can ask me, but I'm just showing you these are available and this is a reality now. You need to know about it. Quercetin. Quercetin is really interesting. Quercetin will increase your glutathione cell concentration, but it's also a great antiviral if you couple it with zinc. It helps zinc, which is the virus killing um, supplement, but it helps it get right into the cell through its, it's an ionopore. Um, different story, but quercetin is very impressive. Whey protein isolate, plenty of companies. Alpha lipoic acid, plenty of companies. And it'll sustain plenty of companies. So far, a lot of companies are out of stock on Wellovate. And, and that's the end. I hope you got something out of it. I hope you got two things out of it. You're going to be sleeping on it tonight. And tomorrow you're going to take action. Until next time.